Lance Blutquagen, uh, and I'm I'm thrilled to be your host uh, again for another another series another in our series thirteen moons and, and thirteen listens, and as we do every month, we introduced what month it is, and this is harvest uh, harvest moon month, and it is uh, Manu Minikisis, uh, harvest moon. Um, and they're here to talk to us a little bit about the moon, its significance, and um, how we apply it to our, our cultural teachings uh, is uh, Debbie Beach Ducharme. Uh, Debbie is a member of Lake Manitou, uh, uh, Manitoba uh, First Nations, also known as Dog Creek and uh, Treaty 2 Territory. And uh, she does a wonderful job of this. So Debbie, please take it away. Anin mino hidenen aki kwe nedish nekaz anemozi bing dunji makudu dem. Again, I'm introducing myself. My English name is Deborah Beach Ducharme, and today we're going to be speaking about the eighth moon in the cycle. And the eighth moon is the harvest moon in Anishinaabem when we say. Manu Minikwe Minike Harvest Moon or Manu Minike. So that basically means it's the time of harvest in our community. It's late summer, and that's when harvesting begins, working together and what is available at this time of year. Again, is a, quite an exciting time working together and uh, it is a time of social interaction sharing of our teachings our way of life and um, this is where we really had an opportunity to build a sense of community and uh, it would prepare us for the upcoming months in the year miigwech Okay, um, then let me get started with this. Uh, obviously, I'm going to introduce uh, our listeners to Sean Momentelli, but before we even do that, uh, David Bouchard coming to you from the unceded land of the Lukwagen here in Victoria, British Columbia. Unceded means that they didn't sign it off. It belongs to them. The Lukwagen consists of both the Songhees and the, and the Eswimal people. Um, I've read so much about him, as you will quickly pick up on, and he's got a new book that's uh, it's very, very challenging uh, to, to speak to. Uh, to speak to uh, kids who were taken away from their homes uh, to the 60s scoop. It's really hard to do it in a positive way. And I've got to say that as I look at some of the challenges before us through truth and reconciliation, so much of that is how do you speak to residential schools and the hurt that's been done? And how do you speak to those children? And and uh, I, I think you you did a, a wonderful uh, job of that. So very quickly then, Sean Joseph Lyons, and uh, Sean's coming to you from St. Mary's, and wait till you see his new book, it's spectacular. And I know they'll give you a showing and he's gonna do a reading. So, good morning. Good morning. Where, where, where do we even start with this, Sean? Let me start with the obvious. Uh, this, is, this is a little bit different than the stuff that you've written in the past because you're into fantasy. Right, yeah, so uh, the initial fantasy stuff was an opportunity for me to take some of those pains, uh, tragedies and triumphs of my life and, and unpack them in a fantasy setting where in life we don't often get closure, we don't get a chance to reconcile with people, people have hurt us and then passed away, and we're sort of left carrying that. But in a fantasy setting, I'm able to get those closures, flesh that stuff out and bring some air therapy to myself, essentially. Um, when I came to Little Bear in foster care, a Mohawk elder came to me and she said, I have been waiting for you for 20 years. And I said, I've just met, how could you be waiting for me for 20 years? It says, I've been waiting for an indigenous author that I truly believe could um, create something like this. Would you, would you do that? And when an elder asks you to do something, you do it. But what I did is I took my own experiences in care and I just put that in a kid's book, trying to address everything from the feelings, the fears, the confusions, the questions, the wonderings. Some days they feel scared, some days they feel angry. Sometimes the homes they're in are really kind, sometimes they aren't so kind. And trying to address every phase so every Indigenous kid in care can say, this is me, I am this little bear, I am experiencing these things. But the hope part in the book comes where we say, you're not alone. Um, when I was in care, I was alone. I had no family, I had no support, I had nobody. 
and there's no one I could even turn to for help if, when I was being abused. So in this case, um, we say that the traditional circle process is available to all Indigenous children in care, where their family, their community, their caregivers can all come together to plan to make sure that these families stay together, stay connected, and that the children still have access to the people that care about them. So that there is a tool that exists now, and I just want to make sure all Indigenous kids know they're not alone, and that there are these resources available to help them. Kids and, and parents and teachers and adults. Teachers. Furthermore, uh, you know, for our listeners and, and our viewers to, to note, it's not just our kids, it's not just Indigenous kids. My neighbor across the street, Patrick, is from Newfoundland, and his uh, his childhood was something very similar. It was just, a, it was a nightmare. And that kind of resource will let all people feel that, yeah, it's a big part of our culture, but it's also relevant to so many other people. Yeah. Absolutely, it's a, there, there's so much crossover. You talk to a lot of different people from different backgrounds, different cultures, and they've had very similar experiences happen. And the circle process, although traditionally Indigenous, isn't exclusively Indigenous. It's a, a process that works for everyone, and it sort of speeds up the planning process for children and could be and should be used in every circle for any child that needs planning. Well, it was easy for you because you've lived it. Could you write something similar for the situation as applies to the kids that are being found right now in graves uh, in grave sites across Canada? Uh, that's a tough one. Um, actually, I have co-authored uh, a book, and the sort of the opening chapter is the experience of a young boy and some of the abuse that he endures that actually leads to his um, murder and burial on a residential school. Now, I'm not a residential school uh, survivor myself, but my grandfather was. And I've heard extensively about his experiences in there. So that chapter I've written to honor him and his experience to kind of give give a voice that he never had. So, um, but it, you you kind of have to put yourself in that place to really feel what that's like. And it's that's not easy to do. So writing a little bear puts me back into foster care, and those feelings come back. Writing about an, an abused child at all puts you in that place, and it's a very awful, terrifying place. And I, I don't think that the greater society really understands or appreciates the impacts that has and how it follows us into adulthood and how treatment is often long and difficult, and unfortunately it's easy to turn to substances to cope, and then what happens is you end up with an adult that gets vilified for their actions rather than seeing this is a, a hurt and broken person that needs supports and needs help. It isn't somebody who should just be allowed to... Um, abuse substances uncontrolled be constantly in and out of prison as a result of the actions like that there needs to be a big shift so these kids that we can talk about in foster care and say you know poor kid in foster care who's been abused who has this going on those child those children eventually become adults who may still have a lot of those same problems but as adults we assume well now you're a grown-up you should have your life in order and you're fully responsible for everything you say and do well that's just not the case unfortunately you know if there's been uh, early exposure to substances through the mother um, or they fall really deeply into um, a substance abuse pattern, you know that the decisions being made aren't of clear, sound mind. And we need to be addressing this uh, with the hurt adults so that ultimately we have a society of people that are healthy and functioning, not people that are constantly being criminalized for the response to their traumas. Let me say what you mean, Sean, where as a nation, Canada is waking up. I mean, I don't, I don't think we're waking up quick enough. I'm very skeptical about uh, why we do what we do. It, we can tend to be driven by money anyway. But mm -hmm. for the first time, I think we're actually talking about the 60 scoop. Would you like to summarize with your understanding of the scoop, uh, the 60 scoop for, for viewers who might not be familiar? Sure. Okay. So the 60 scoop is actually a period that started in the 50s and didn't even end until the early 80s, where Indigenous children were systematically removed from their families, often for the most minute reasons. Uh, for instance, if um, it's found out that a child had vegetables and fruit for breakfast, um, which would have been a traditional way to eat, that didn't meet up with the um, Euro-Canadian version of what children should be eating, and then they were removed. Or they go in the house and see the pantries aren't stocked with what we believe the children should be eating. They obviously need to be removed and put into care. And it really came down to a culture clash where Indigenous people, we had our ways, our traditions, our foods. We took good care of ourselves and our children. And now you have this new system that's come in and said, no, this is how it needs to be done. And if you don't line up with this, we're removing your children because we feel they're in danger. And part of that was they would go into care and they would be adopted into non-Indigenous homes, homes that met the, the Euro-Canadian 
uh, way of life to ensure that these children had that kind of upbringing rather than the traditional upbringing. So when I went into care, I had no access to my parents. I had no access to my people, my culture. The band wasn't even contacted. They made no effort to record who I was, where I came from. In three separate documents in my CAS file, I was listed as uh, Caucasian, Jewish, and Mexican. Um, I'm, not, I'm none of those things. Yet no effort was put in to really say he has an indigenous history. The whole idea was to wipe that out. So I got adopted by non-indigenous uh, anthropology professors. So being a cultural anthropology professors, they were very well educated, um, supported me in anything and everything I wished to pursue, but they weren't given any information either. So it took me many years to find who I was, where I was from, where my family was, and so on. But it was designed to systematically destroy um, the indigenous culture and the people, very much the takeover from residential school. And now there's actually more indigenous kids in care than there ever were in residential schools. So the problem has shifted and is now even greater. So you were, uh, the fact that you've done the drug series tells me that you're very likely uh, usually write what you what you read. My my guess is that as a as a youth you were a good reader. Uh, yes, actually it was. Um, strangely, I didn't like to read until I was forced to read To Kill a Mockingbird in high school, and I found that I, I fell in love with the book. And I didn't realize that books could be exciting. They could be dynamic. They could pull you in, and they could offer up a really powerful life lesson, like To Kill a Mockingbird does. And then, of course, once I stumble into the, the sci-fi fantasy realm, well, now anything and everything is possible. It's easy to say I'm a huge Lord of the Rings fan. I've read some of the Star Wars books that are separate from the actual movies. And I just love that world building. Um, unfortunately, when I started writing, I stopped reading because I realized whatever I was currently reading was going to directly influence the way I wrote. I wanted to write my way. So I would, I would uh, write a book. And then I'd go read about 10 books. Then I'd come back and write another book just so I could keep my voice clear. Because it's very easy to start sounding like C.S. Lewis if you're reading C.S. Lewis while you're trying to write your own book. And then you read the difference between before and after C.S. Lewis. I'm like, that's not the same voice. Isn't I find that um, uh, books as well as even movies, TV shows, and even video games offer an opportunity to explore, to take a journey, and to really just... Uh, see how others do it. Like I'm a big Star Trek fan because I've always loved the way they would craft the episodes. They'd give you some sort of exciting, the ship explodes, what happened? And then it says 24 hours before and then it works up to that point. Yeah. So if you can give them that hook and then you can build to how did that happen and can it be avoided, then the, then the story pulls you in and you get excited. So I started to craft my own stuff around that where this big terrible thing happens. And then we go back in time and work our way towards what that is and why that happened. What about some of the stuff that kids read, Sean? Something like uh, kind of um, obviously there's Harry Potter, but what about Percy Jackson or what about uh, come on the Vampire series? Uh, Stephanie Myers, uh, uh, come on, Sean, New Dawn, uh, yeah, the series, Twilight series. The Twilight series. What about that guy? Have you have you read that? I started to. Um... I, I love a good romance story. All my books have a core romance element to them. They have to, or I lose interest. Yeah. And I like that romance build. It just, I don't know, it, it wasn't quite for me, given the age difference and the, just some of the weirdness about being a vampire and a werewolf and then this, this human girl. But uh, I could see why the appeal was there or the Divergent series with, um, uh, you know, a girl rising up and um, finding her strengths and her skills. Um, I, I love uh, female leads. One book has a very strong female lead. Um, yeah. They don't have enough voice in literature, so I love seeing that. Hunger Games. Yeah, Hunger Games. Yeah, exactly. Hunger Games. I can't believe I didn't mention that. The idea of this girl making her way through this killing field, uh, it was amazing. It's incredible. So, there's, yeah, there's a lot of good stuff out there, and it's interesting. I keep my ear. I don't necessarily read the teen books, but I keep my ear on what's popular and why is popular to just get a sense of what's out there and what's happening. I mean, you can write an amazing book, but if it's not what's current, you may not get an opportunity to put it out there. Yeah, Ron. Now, what about some of the indigenous superheroes that we're seeing, and all of a sudden they're appearing, aren't they? Well, I've been in video games for years, but as the stereotypical feather-wearing, face-painted indigenous yeah. Uh, characters, I mean, of course, I'm drawn to them being indigenous, but yeah, to actually see genuine superheroes with good backstories that are respected by the other heroes instead of, you know, riding on the back of, uh, of the horse. Yeah, and it's like, okay, we have them as leads. We don't have them as secondary or stereotype characters, and that's good to see. 
Okay, um, <laughs> let, let's do this. I, I've read the book, I've seen the illustrations in it, and I said to you earlier, it's, it's, it's so pleasing to me that it can be a pleasant, a pleasant exploration. It doesn't have to be dark and glum, which in many ways it was. Uh, mm -hmm. The illustrator has has captured that, and you you haven't missed a beat, have you? You said it all. You said let me let me address some of the positive things, and it was explained in the book. Would you could you do a bit of a reading for us, or do you have it there in front of you? I do. I've got it right here. So, okay. Little Bear feels scared and alone. He has to leave his family and spend time in foster care. What made Little Bear feel the most afraid was not knowing what was going on. He did not know where his family had gone. Little Bear thought maybe he had been bad, and that is why he was sent away. He thought maybe his family didn't love him anymore. Little Bear was moved around to different homes. Some of them were friendly, but some were not. Some of the other little animals played with him, but some were mean to him. Little Bear still feels scared and alone. He just wants to go home. Sometimes when Little Bear is angry, he roars to show his feelings. Sometimes when he is scared, he wants to run away. One day, Little Bear is invited to a traditional circle with his family and his community. Together, they smudge, sing traditional songs, and take turns talking with the talking feather. Little Bear does not know how to share his feelings, but everyone in the circle reminds him how special he is and that they are all there to help him feel safe and loved. Little Bear is told that it is not his fault that he is in foster care. He is also told that it is because his family is having a hard time caring for him and keeping him safe. Little Bear finds his voice in the traditional circle and feels relieved to share all the feelings he has been keeping inside. He shares that he loves his family very much. He also shares that he has a lot of big feelings about what is going on. Everyone in the traditional circle hear his words. Little Bear is happy that his family is part of the circle. Now he does not need to feel scared and alone. Everyone in the circle promises to work together to help Little Bear feel loved and secure and to give him a safe home. Although Little Bear is still in foster care with his family and community working together and walking beside him, Little Bear no longer feels scared and alone. And you dedicated the book to Wendy. I dedicated it to Wendy. Yeah, she's the elder who uh, told me I was going to write this book. Oh, there you go. I, for a reason, I thought it was a child. No, no, no. It's just uh, th there are more in the series coming out that deal with different aspects of foster care, yeah. and they will have uh, different dedications, including uh, one to my own nephew who is in limbo. We are fighting for him and advocating for him um, in a system that is just bouncing him around. And one of those books is specifically written about his journey, so it'll be dedicated to him. Any ramifications on the man you are today? Uh, yeah, well, I've had a long way to go over, say, people that don't have those same experiences. There was a YouTube video I watched once where a teacher lined up students and said, we're going to run a fair race. And so the kids get ready to run. And then he says, well, hold on a second. I actually have to make it fair. If you grew up in a home with alcoholism, take 10 steps back. If you grew up in a home with one parent, take another 10 steps back. And so on and so on until the kids were staggered all over the field. And they said, now run the race. And they said, but this isn't fair anymore. It's like, but this is where certain people start based on what's happened to them. So I can say I've had to take 150 steps forward to get to where most people start. But what choice did I have? I had to because this is my life and this is my journey and I can either let it go or I can fight for it. And it's not been easy. There's still uh, attachment struggles that I have, trust issues that I have, even into adulthood where these things get ingrained in too young. They're very, very difficult to overcome. And there was a time when I used substances to cope. And uh, but then I realized long term that's going to destroy my life. It's going to destroy the family that I've built. I'm going to build dependencies and it really doesn't actually heal anything. Um, so I decided I'm going to pick up and come forward and I'm going to make the best of the life that I have left. And in so doing, I want to be able to reach back down to those that are stuck where I once was and say, hey, there's hope. This, this period of time isn't going to be forever. And when you're out, you can do whatever you want in life. You know, and that's just the message I wanted to be able to give back. And if I do nothing else, then at least I've done something very positive. And that coming from a man who came from a, a pretty pretty good home. It sounds like you loved your, your foster parents and they were great, great people to be with. They were, yes. I mean, it wasn't easy for them. I, I put them through every possible problem you can imagine, but they endured and they 
um, we we still have a great relationship now, and I'm very grateful for them and for that. And I don't think I know who I am now without them. And I think you knew your birth mother. Do you, do you have a communication with her? Uh, she passed away a couple of years ago. I reached out to her towards the end of her life to get some questions answered and to basically say to her, um, despite everything that happened, I don't hold anything against you. Let's spend the time together that we can. And then she passed away. And I was, I was glad that um, I, I could do that rather than put my anger on her because she wasn't in a place where she'd even be able to receive that or know what to do with it. So I thought, you know, I've grown up, I've matured. It's my opportunity now to reach out in a positive way. My birth father, he, he passed away a few years ago as well. And we were on, in touch briefly on Facebook, again, asking questions and finding out who they were and just, you know, to get those, pe those missing pieces of your own life. And again, same thing with him, no hostility, just, you know, the past is what it is, and let's move forward with what time we have left. Oh, good for you. I wonder if you'll ever get a chance to speak to how hard that must have been on your mom. I say to kids all the time when I speak to them, there is nothing, nothing that compares to the love of a mother. Never put yourself between a mother and her baby. If you're in the bush and a bear comes out with her cub, leave. Yes, exactly. And a, and a moose comes out with her calf, don't stick around. If you're a principal of a school as I was, and an angry mother comes in, I leave. All right. Very yes, of course. <laughs> of course. You know, and I know how, how much of a how hard it was on you as a child, but I mean, I don't for a second think that that foster care is just not murder on moms. Oh, if you think about it, separating a child from a mother oh. is like the probably the most traumatic thing you can do. The child relies on the mother, and the mother birthed that child. That bond is unbelievable, and to completely sever that is the most devastating thing. It's you are causing more trauma in that instance than pretty much anything else that will happen barring severe abuses and so on. But yeah, I mean, that's got to stop that it has to stop. It's like the worst thing you can do to people. Okay, as a fictional reader, here's my quick question for you. What what book am I thinking about? Or what series am I thinking about where they cut they, they you go in and there's a, there's a you've got a, a totem or you have a, a, a and they cut that bond between the human and their spirit. I'll give you oh, yes. Philip Pullman. The golden, the golden, golden, the golden, where Philip Pullman and they, everybody has a, has a little spirit guardian. And remember, they, they're trying to take them and they cut them away and they've got them all in a different room. Philip Pullman in the, uh, the golden, either way. Uh, listen, uh, thanks to the reading. I think we've got a question, uh, Sean, for you from, uh, from Josh, this little boy Spencer. Sure, and sure. He's, he's got the book. So let's. Uh, I'm assuming he's there and he's going to come in and your bird's being so good he hasn't pooped on your shoulder once and I keep waiting for it. Not yet. I'm sure he will, though. <laughs> I'm sure he will, too. And birds are really one one person animals, aren't they, too? They just, uh, oh, man, they bond. And my parrot was with me for 13 years when my little girl was born. The parrot went ballistic. All she wanted to do was kill our little girl because that's my dad. That's my human. And she would attack her and it went on and on. Finally, we had to, to give her away. And uh, I don't know, she would have been about 40 years old when I gave her away. And it was just awful. Yeah. Yeah, he's very much like that. He's tolerant of the children when they're alone, but when he's on me, nobody can reach for him. He will bite. Yeah. And I keep telling him, it's okay, we can share. He just doesn't seem to understand. Yeah, no, I agree with him. <laughs> I mean, no sharing on my watch. <laughs> right. Hi, Spencer. Hi. Nice and loud. Uh, my question is, what is smudging? Smudging, good question. So in the book, you would have most likely seen the smudging section in the back. Smudging is, um, it's a cleansing ritual. There are four medicines, uh, tobacco, sage, sweetgrass, um, and cedar. And when we smudge, we, we burn the medicines and we bring them up to cleanse to, to our eyes so we will see good things, our ears that we will hear good things, um, our mouth so we will speak good things over our body as a cleansing. Um, everything from uh, calming the mind to um, soothing the soul for protection. Um, in, uh, it's recommended that you do it at least once a day, if not more. Um, it's a very sacred practice to Indigenous people, um, and um, I've only recently heard about it myself in the last few years and, and began to partake in it. But uh, if you never have, I would recommend that you uh, 
you smudge for sure. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, this is it then as we wrap this thing up, Sean. This is an official invitation. My shack for Italian coffee anytime you're in Victoria. And I awesome. please do, that'd be wonderful. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. Good luck with the book. I know it's selling like crazy. And for those of you who I've not sent it to before, Good Minds is not only the biggest distributor of Indigenous books in Canada, they're the biggest in the world. Use them or lose them. Come on. I'd pay more, and yet you can get books for less. They know what they're doing, so please make sure you check it out. And if you've not checked us up on, on, uh, on YouTube, check us up, and you can see Sean in this interview, but you'll see others. Uh, 13 Moons, 13 Reads, and this is, a, this is a real special occasion for us, and we're grateful for your time. So here's a warm hug from, uh, from uh, Victoria. Thanks, Sean. Miigwech. Miigwech. Miigwech.